Don't worry, I'm looking. I'm waiting right till 5.30. All right, I guess it's 5.30. All, everybody ready? All right, um, just I guess a little bit about myself real quick. Um, I'm Catherine Pebworth. I am a professor here at LMU, um, mainly in, well, in the sport and exercise science department. Uh, but one of my hobbies for about the past, uh, I guess about 30, 35 years has been genealogy. Uh, my mom got me interested in it, um, got me interested in going to DAR, um, going to Continental Congress and at the library. And it first started out as, you know, I was a little interested in it, but it was more of here, go make copies. Here, make copies of this page, make copies of this. Until finally one year it clicked and I was like, um, okay, I'm gonna do some research too. And so I've been doing that ever since. Um, I am for DAR, I am our chapters lineage research committee officer and the for Tennessee, the Appalachian district lineage research chair. Um, so those of you that wanted me in Virginia, Judy, I'm sorry. <laughs> My friends in Tennessee got me. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, breaking through brick walls that we may have um, and thinking outside the box. I um, mean, a lot of the knowledge I have gained um, is just my own. And then also I've been attending um, classes with IGHR, um, the Institute of Research and Historical, um, I've got it over there. I've got it later on, but I've been going to classes over in Athens, Georgia uh, for a four, four or five years. Um, so I've been taking classes uh, for a week in the summer with that. And so I'm gonna go grab my PowerPoint. And we got somebody's background noise. Um, so with, oh, with brick walls, um, we all have brick walls. Uh, how do we get over them? What do we look for? Where can we find information? Where can we find hints? How do we break down that brick wall that we have that gets us to another generation? Um, it's like putting together a puzzle uh, using all of those pieces to make the picture. Uh, building your story, building your case. Um, and as I kind of talked about as we first kind of came on, this may be like a fire hose um, of information. Um, we can always come back later and do, um, you know, more specific classes if you want. Um, or certain areas to touch on. Uh, this is just kind of helping you break through and think about the brick walls in different ways. All right. And so I kind of chuckle um, when people say that they finished their family tree. I'm done. You know, this is only, this is an example of 10 generations back. Um, that is not including yourself, 2,046 people. And that's only 10 generations back. So your tree continues on. Uh, to kind of put this in perspective for you, um, for me, that eighth great grandfather I uh, was a gentleman by the name of Colonel Joseph Ball, uh, who was born May 25th, 1649 in England. 1649 is a ways away, but it's really in the big scheme of things, not that long ago. Um, also within this, to kind of put this into um, a perspective, 
Um, my eighth great grandfather, um, Colonel Joseph Ball is who I went into Jamestown under. Um, he is my Jamestown link. And Joseph Ball is actually George Washington's grandfather. So you can kind of start to put together what those generations back kind of exist. Uh, some things we're gonna talk about. Um, different topics that I'm gonna hit you with and to get you um, to start to think about. And so one of the things um, that uh, somebody by the name of Dr. Deborah Abbott uh, likes to talk about is cluster genealogy and looking at your fan club. And your fan club are your family, the associates of that family, and neighbors. And so starting to look at that to help break down brick walls. So not just looking at that direct line, but then also start to look at their siblings, which you could have 10, 13, 15, or more in a family. Looking at, you know, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins, um, even looking at in-laws. You know, your family may be in some of the documentation that their in-laws had. So starting to think of genealogy and research for your brick wall as a spiral process instead of a straight line. So starting to look at those other people that surround your ancestors. And so we wanna know who, what, when, where, why, and how. You know, that fan club, those people around your person, who are they? Again, thinking beyond that direct line. Your ancestor that you're hoping to prove um, may not be in their father's will. They may not be listed. And so you're like, they're not listed in the dad's will that we think is the father, but are they listed in a brother's or sister's will or an uncle's will? And so starting to put those pieces together. So thinking outside of our normal box that we tend to think about. And so doing that complete analysis, having that timeline and start to identify those gaps that you have. We all have those gaps. We all have those. I can get to this spot and then I think I can link here, but how am I gonna get there? Though so that one or two or three generations, how am I gonna make that leap? You know, tied together by blood and law and land and census. You know, we may lose them for a period of time. You know, all of a sudden they may have been in Connecticut and then we don't know where they went. Where did they go? How are we gonna find them? And so starting to look at that fan club, many times when people, as you know, migrated, they migrated in groups. It was rare, very rare that only a small family migrated by themselves. And so starting to look at people that surrounded them, did they move? Can you find them in a census somewhere else? Oh, well, there's my, there are my people. Or where did they go? And so if you've not seen this book, it's a great book um on migration routes and it has lots of different routes that people took um as we know many people came through the cumberland gap but not everybody did not everybody went west. some people that went west turned way before some people turned later on and so here's an example 
Um, and it comes also, you can find this in the book, but I just got it online, as you can see the documentation. But starting to look at where your people went or where you think they went. I have one that I'm trying to um, prove. Um, it is a, a person I would love to have as my ancestor. Um, and we think we may be able to make the jump, but I haven't yet. Um, it's a gentleman by the name of Stephen Hopkins, um, who was Jamestown. He left, went back to England, and came back over on the Mayflower. And so with this, there's a shoemate and a Bailey line within that, but can I make that connection? And so from the Mayflower, I've got shoemates and Baileys in the Mayflower, but looking at coming down the Kings, where did my mouse go? Coming down the Kings Highway, as you start to drift down, hitting on these trails down to Williamsburg and Jamestown, starting to look at different stops, looking at different forts along the way, looking at different stops and taverns and churches. Because many times people would stop there, sometimes they would register, Sometimes they would buy goods. And sometimes there are receipts depending on the shopkeepers or the forts. And so starting to look at those migration paths and saying, you know, can I make that connection? Mine were up, you know, coming down from the coming down from um, Plymouth down through, they ended up in the middle part of um, Virginia. And so part of what I'm doing now is starting to look at all of those areas along the way to say, yes, the, this is the same person and this is how they made it there. And start thinking about different migration paths. And then there's a whole lot more as well. Looking at passenger arrival records. You know, if you can make it across the pond. I can't lower it, I can't hear it, go on. Um, or at any time looking at, you know, where did they come in? Where did they arrive? I don't know. You have those major ports and then you have a lot of minor ports to look at. Looking at not only where they departed from, but looking at their arrival list as well. And then don't forget about insurance registries. If they brought any belongings or goods, they may have registered them with insurance. And so that may be in that ship's log of, you know, I brought over a desk, a blanket and a, um, a box or a trunk or I may have brought over a trunk with this amount of things in it. And I registered that for insurance. And so looking at those, you may, you know, the departure list, they may not be on it, or they may not have it, or the arrival list, but they may have that insurance registry. So starting to think outside the normal boxes that we think about. Then we all know about census. We know about census records, you know, but starting to look at census that has been taken throughout that person's lifetime. And as part of your data that you're gathering, look at every part of that census. You know, in each census, they've added things or taken things away. And so gathering as much data on your people that you can from the census. But then part of that fan club that becomes important to help break down those brick walls is looking at 10 houses or 15 houses before your people 
and 10 and 15 houses after your people. Because depending on their occupation, depending on if they moved, again, they may move as a group. And if you lose yours or aren't able to figure it out where they went, you know, sometimes we lose them in, you know, 1840, 1850. We're like, where did they go? I have no idea where they went. Or this might be my potential because I've had some breadcrumbs. Where did they go? Oh, I'm going to look at the people around them. They may have moved together. Um, if you actually have a land map, which I've got an example here in a couple of slides, um, that it has people's names, look at everybody around them. Because as we know, census, they mainly went up and down any type of street. And sometimes they went side to side. Sometimes they went up one side and down another. But part of that fan club is also people behind them. And so that's why it's important if you have a map to look at everybody that's around them. Don't forget about state census. State census is normally in, you know, the regular federal census is every 10 years. State census a lot of times is then in those years in between or that fifth year in between. So if you have a census, federal census in 2000, 2005, there might have been a state census. And then looking at the census, and it may be looking on several pages as well, um, for similar occupations, because they might have traveled together. And so paying attention to their occupation as well. Uh, pay attention to those migration patterns. Where might they have gone? Now, do we all, do they all follow those rules of migration? <laughs> no, because we don't even follow some of the rules of migration. But a lot of them in the early days, they used those old roads, those old roads that they had, um, the trading paths of the Native Americans. Then thinking outside the box of the census. Uh, well, sorry, then with the, our lovely 1890 census. As we know, most of them were badly burned. Um, during the commerce, um, when the, there was a fire at the Commerce Department building. And so a lot of times we don't have that 1890, unless you were one of the 1% of your ancestors that actually survived in the census. Um, I don't have that luck. I definitely have not been able to find that 18 cent, any in the, those few that survived. So it's really then thinking outside the box for that 1890. So looking at all kinds of different things that we're going to talk about. And many of us in the genealogy world are excited, even though it's April Fools, for next year when the 1950 census will come out. Um, they have that 75 year rule um, that they use when they release new census. So a lot of people are excited about that. So that thinking outside the box, Looking at those non-population schedules, agriculture, industry and manufacturing schedules, mortality, social statistics, um, looking at community, the value of real estate, did they move or how much money does your, do your people have and could they afford to go? Number of schools, you know, a lot of people will start to, um, some went to school, some didn't, uh, but a lot of times if they did, they were around the school because they, you know, couldn't travel great, great distances to go to school. Also, there are some states and areas that had a dog tax. 
So investigating that, did they pay a tax on their dogs? Uh, for the newbies, the 75 year rule. Um, oh, there you go. So the Joseph answered it. Um, so they, okay, never mind. <laughs> if you're good. Then in 1880 only, the defective, dependent, and delinquent census. And so looking at those in the insane asylum, if you can't find your people on a census, have you checked the insane asylum? Have you checked the prison? Um, or pauper or indigent. They had that type of census in 1880. And so if all of a sudden you lost, lost your people, where are they? Um, and so starting to look at it that way as well. Another avenue for you to go and look at. Um, some of mine have kind of disappeared. I'm like, uh, were they prisoners? Oop, did I, go? I went the wrong way. Then some others to think about. The 1840 census, um, looking at pensions for the Revolutionary War, uh, looking at other military service, and when you start to look at these, make sure you look at the backside um, because on a lot of these pensions, they had information on the backs of them. I um, mean, a lot of those have been scanned. So as you're going through, making sure you look at everything. Slave schedules. A lot of times the name of the owner was listed. Even if they did not name the slaves, the owner was listed. Indian census rolls. If they lived close to, uh, Indians living close to the reservation. In 1890, there was a special census for surviving union vets and widows. Um, but again, a lot of these in 1921 um, were burned. And so just an example of a census. Um, so starting to look at people in front. So we are looking at where my mouse is here with uh, my ancestor with Garlington. Uh, this is from Chambers County, Alabama in 1870. And it has listed age, people within the household, the trade, where they were born. And then this one lists whether they can read and write and if they went to school. And if you notice, there's quite a few on this list that can read or write and some went to school. But then also starting to look, if you look at the household number nine above Garlington, you have Knight with the family and then an older gentleman. And so this may be a father of the wife. It may be an uncle. Um, it may be a friend. Um, if it's younger, it may be somebody that uh, the parents have died, so they're an orphan, and a lot of times aunt and uncles would take them in. And so paying attention to everything that is on a census, because uh, it gives you lots of information. And so some with the census, um, this is a great book. Um, if you haven't heard of it, the map guide to the federal census, and it goes by state and it has it by county and it has it 
all the different things that county used to be. So for example, I just picked out Claiborne County because it gives you an idea of if you can't find records in Claiborne County, which would make sense, but could it be in another county depending on the time period? So in 1790, Claiborne County was Indian lands and part of Haw Hawkins County. And so you would think part of that 1790 information would be in Hawkins. That's what you think, but you never know. It may all be in Claiborne or all may be in Hawkins. Then in, 18, in the 1800s, it was Indian lands and Granger County. Then in 1810, it was Claiborne. And then in 1860, Union County was chiseled out of part of Claiborne. And so you would assume that you would go look at information for whatever part of Claiborne County you're in and either the Indian lands, Hawkins, Granger, or Union, depending on the time period. But this is where it, you gotta think outside the box. It may be housed with all of Claiborne or Granger may have said, no, I'm gonna take all of this part. And so starting to look at what counties are called and were called um, to look at where you wanna find documentation because it could be anywhere. It's part of that problem of the brick wall. Here's an example of land. And so on the left-hand side, you've got lots of land with different people's names. Um, it's hard to see, so I blew up a section. Um, and so you could start to look at who are the neighbors? Who's part of that fan club? And so if I was looking at um, this, I believe Lynch, I would look at all the people around, not just on the same street. So birth, marriage, and death records. You know, we all know the Bible, church records, tombstones. Um, junior and senior may not be related. Um, marriage, witness, and bondsmen's, and land records, they're on those records for a reason. You have a witness to a marriage for some reason. They're part of that fan club. They know them. It's not often that you're just going to go and grab somebody off the street and say, hey, I don't know you, but can you be a witness to this marriage and sign? Death records. Not only just the death record, but looking at the will. If there were young kids, guardianship papers, where did they go? Sometimes or a lot of the times guardianship papers will name the parents. For a will, that letter of administration, probate records, final estate settlements and inventories. And a lot of these were settled way after the death. And it could be several years. So if you're looking at, you know, a final estate settlement or an inventory for a will that you think you might have, it may not be that next month or the next month. I would keep looking it may be a year or two down the road that you will find it, if it is there. Church and church parish records. So a lot of them hold a wealth of information. Um, births and marriage and deaths membership committees, finance records, who gave what amount of money, uh, minutes, 
Sunday school attendance, women's auxiliary organizations that use that church. So they may not be members of that church, but they were there. They came into the church. They were part of that group, youth groups. So starting to look at all of these different records to help with those brick walls. Baptismal records may have, may have godparents listed. That's part of that fan club. A lot of times divorce was frowned upon, so they may live apart and split the kids. And so you may have one set of kids going one way and one set of kids going another. Um, with Quakers, there are um, lots of great records. Um, if you have any Quakers in your family, their records, there's a wealth of them. Um, I happened to discover some of my past schools um, were Quakers, and I've gotten a wealth of information from that. Scottish may not take husband's name. They may keep their maiden name. So that's something to be aware of. This is a book that I just recently acquired. Um, it was published in 2019, but it has a lot of great information for churches, denominations, um, websites to go to, where to find some records. Um, I haven't used it a whole lot, but I'm going to because it's got all kinds of great information. So the proof of residence. So they may not show up in a census, or it may be that census was lost, or what we have a lot of the um, town hall or where they house documents was burned. The courthouse burned. All of the records, they're gone. We all hate those burned, those burned courthouses, burned counties, I hate them but some proof of residence. Did they pay taxes? Were they on a jury? They're listed. Were they part of a militia? Did they own land? Deed books, power of attorney. You know, the location of the land, where is it? Documents for witnesses. You know, and there are times when I'm going through books and documents, you know, you get to the back and if it's indexed, you're excited and you're like, all right. And you go to that page, you go to page 21 and you're like, oh, they're a witness. Uh, next one, oh, they're a witness. Well, that doesn't give us the great information that we love to have it at least gives us proof of residence. They were in that county, they were in that city because they were a witness or they were on jury duty or they were on the county commission or whatever it is. And so then you go, oh, okay, well, at least I got some proof of residence. And so linking those generations, looking at the will, and we all love it when, you know, our ancestor lists everybody. We're excited, we're like, yes, there it is, my daughter, my son. But like I said, also start to look at brothers and sisters' wills, especially if you don't find it in the parents. Draft registration, pension files, birth records, the family in the census, more than one generation may be listed. You may have a parent or a grandparent living with the family. Death records may contain those names. Uh, the NSDAR database, the GRS ancestor database, 
is you don't have to be a DAR member to have access to that. Uh, there's some portions of it you do, uh, but a lot of it you can go and find and look and search and you can have all this documentation of, you know, where somebody was born, married, died, children, or at least that line, direct line of kids. With compiled military service records, looking at the individual deceased person files, draft registrations, the classifications, they tried to serve, but they were unfit to serve. There's a record of that. You think, oh, well, they're about the age for whatever war. Well, I can't find them anywhere. There's no pension. Well, let's go look and see if they're in the unfit to serve. Americans who served other forces. Not everybody served for the US. Some served Mexico, Canada, other places. Applications for medals. It's a place we don't think to look. Casualty sheet, were they injured? Furlough and leave of absence. Hospital, red, hospital record, bed cards when they were in the hospital. Did they have an alias? I have one right now that is redlined, which means for DAR, they say, no, he was not uh, because he lived in South Carolina and supposedly fought for Georgia in the Revolutionary War. His dad fought in Georgia. And so there may be a, an alias there. So I'm starting to look at that. Did they have a pension record? And that military bounty land Then newspapers. Newspapers can give us all kinds of information. Um, if you're lucky, your ancestor is mentioned. Um, they may have done a story on your ancestor and their kids or their parents or their spouse. But for newspapers as well, reading to see what was happening at that time. You know, yellow fever. All of a sudden, there was all these deaths. The Spanish flu. Right now, years from now, people will read about 2020 and 2021 and why did all of a sudden, you know, people die? Oh, well, reading the newspaper, you'll find out, oh, COVID-19. Looking at small groups, Small newspapers, local newspapers, regional, state, trade, professional. African-American newspapers. I've got a nice little book uh, that Tim, uh, I think Pickens, um, don't quote me on the last name, wrote, but he's got a lot of different newspapers to look up that are online. Uh, the Freedmen's Journal came out in 1827. And so people may be mentioned in there, not just African-Americans. So looking anywhere that you can think of. Court records, both federal and state, trial, Court of Appeals, Supreme Court, looking at all those different records, all those different places, because you never know with court documents. Whoa, whoa, hold on, sorry. I don't know what, there we go. Because you never know where they're named. 
They could be a party in a lawsuit. I've got several um, on my couch line. They just love to be part of lawsuits. So they give me that wealth of information, whether they were suing or being sued. Were they charged with the crime? Witness, serving as a juror. I had lots of mine that were jurors. You get excited when you start to go, oh, the, oh okay, they were a juror. But at least that gives you that resonance. Um, enemies club, peace bonds. If they were farmers and had livestock, look at livestock brands. If you owned cattle and you had, you know, you branded them, you had to register that somewhere. Is there a central repository for court records or do you have to go to each county or district for the records? Yes and no. Um, Ancestry and Family Search has been doing great job um, of putting up court records. Um, but a lot of them, you got to have boots on the ground. It depends, county by county. Um, and we're going to talk about that here in just a second with courthouse. Um, but it's talking to local people and they'll tell you who to see that can help you with those records. Um, some are online, but not all of them are online. And so kind of continuing, bounty, land and animals, cost of water. Did they have an apprenticeship? A lot of times with apprenticeships, it was written down. Looking at deeds and petitions for sale, estate notices and final notices. So you never know where you might find your people. So when you have to go to the courthouse, you know, talk to local people, talk to the local um, historical society. Um, they'll tell you who to see that will get you the records that you need. Um, you always have that one person that, yep, they'll help you and other people may be like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go down in the basement because that's where a lot of them are. Ah, I don't want to go down there. It's dirty and nasty. And then there's some are like, yep, you go down. I'm not going down there. Good luck. But you find all kinds of stuff. Um, dockets, you know, appearance and judgment. In the minutes, names may appear. Order books, what the judgment was. Loose papers are very rare, but they are supporting files. Bonds, a promise, may have a cosigner that's a kin, neighbor, or close friend. You know, legal notices. Now there are some, um, this is a website of London Central Criminal Court. Um, that has the proceedings of Old Bailey that you can go into um, that had um, criminal trials held in London. So if you think any of your ancestors were possibly in criminal court, you can go and look it up. One of my Favorite and least favorite things, because they are a wealth and great information, are manuscript collections. People love them and people hate them. Um, they are personal books and papers that people have donated. It may be years of research, stacks, and they just go here. You know, diaries and letters, um, records. Many are not microfilmed or online. They're definitely not indexed. You get a folder and there's no index to it. You just sit there and go through them. Um, Nuck Muck 
um, is the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collection. Um, so there's some manuscripts that are starting to come online, uh, but it may just be who's in there and what they may find or what they may have. So it's been now two years because of COVID. Um, when I was over at IGHR at uh, University of Georgia, where it's held, um, I went to the Hargret Library. And one of my ancestors that I was looking up was Trimble. And these are families T through WB in the LeConte Genealogical Collection. And this is box 10. And it has folders in there. This is box 10. I don't remember how many there were. There were several that I had to go through. But lots of loose paper. And there they let you take pictures. So you take pictures of things. Um, you don't wear gloves because of, no matter how old it is, because they believe even though you've got um, oils on your fingers, but gloves, you may rip it. And so here you're touching old, old documents and you're like, yeah, very careful. But within this box, I found a land deed, a survey for my ancestor, John Trimble, in the 96th district in Abbeville, South Carolina. This was loose in the box. Is it anywhere else? Is it in a deed book? Probably, but who knows? So I found it, I'm like, ha, gotcha. You were in Abbeville. Archives. The Tennessee State Archives has just undergone a whole renovation. You know, go to the archives, government, religious, college, university. ETSU has the archives of Appalachia. Um, I just discovered it right before COVID hit and I was like, ah, I know exactly where it is on campus, but I have not been there yet. The Virginia Heritage website is a guide to manuscript and archival collections in Virginia. And so you can have a basic search and it will tell you where it is. Uh, there are a lot of times that people, depending, will go and pull things for you if you know exactly where it is, what box, what folder, instead of, yeah, you've got it somewhere. Sometimes people will go and pull it for you. So with manuscripts, starting to think about some key words, you know, typing in their occupation, activities, interest. Search engines, go to Google, type in a name and a manuscript. It may come up. Uh, my ball, I typed in ball plus George Washington manuscript, and I got all kinds of information. Locating these different repositories. Um, Pineville Library has a great genealogy section. Um, Claiborne County has a great genealogy section. So starting to use local libraries, you never know what they have. So for, whoop, for wills, they may not be named in a will, but they were given land earlier, especially if, it's an, if it is an older child. So looking for records earlier. Was the property or do they have property in two states? Where's the probate? It may be in one state or the other. So some other hints for brick walls. 
as you're going through and looking at documents and looking at books, turn the page. Look at the page before the page you want and the page after, because you never know what you will find. Look for those direct and indirect evidence, those breadcrumbs. Look for parallels, some differences. Random people do not appear in a record for no reason. They are in your ancestor's record for a reason. Or your ancestor is in their record for a reason. Check Google Books. There's all kinds of genealogy books on Google Books for free that you can download. Remember that there are always exceptions. Just because your ancestor, you think this is what the majority of people do. If your ancestors are anything like mine, no, they're the exception. They do something off the wall and crazy. Get organized, however you get organized. Um, I've got, when I do research, I organize in different ways. Um, I do have, and I don't think I have time to get to it, um, but I do use some spreadsheets by state and by county because I've got a lot of ancestors on different lines that are in the same county. And so if I go to this book for this ancestor, and then years later, I'm researching this ancestor, I've got to go back to this book. And so if I'm only in a place for a short amount of time, I look at all my ancestors that I know at that time that are in that county. Are they in that book? Are they in that document? In that document? Collecting signatures. One, it's always fun to look at what your ancestor's signature looks like. But then it can help you later on distinguish is this my John Smith or is this another John Smith? If my John Smith does not know how to read and write and all of his signatures are the X and I find a signature by John Smith, more than likely that's not mine or vice versa. Research all the people with that same surname in the area. They may be relatives, they may not. DNA matches and trees. So start to use some of those DNA matches. Um, I am solving a, working on solving a personal um, DNA mystery within my family of my grandfather is not my biological grandfather. So I'm starting to use DNA matches to determine that side of my family. So this is another great book. Um, it's in its fourth edition. Um, and it's just got a lot of great information on where to find things, um, where to go. Um, let's see. Uh, which DNA group? I've got several. I've got M Family Tree, 23andMe, and Living DNA. But you can always put, do one of those and upload your DNA to GEDmatch. And then that goes across all of them. Um, I'm going to skip over a few things. And if you want, we want to come back, we can but there are a few things I wanna share. Oh, you never know what you'll find on the internet. Um, this was one of my ancestors, the one that I showed you on the census. Um, he had lots of patents and you can see his signature down here at the bottom. Uh, I can come back to that story. Here's an example of what I was talking about with the Excel spreadsheet. So I know if I'm looking in Georgia in Fulton County, I've got these names to deal with.
And so there are lots of different places to get information. Again, IGHR, the Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research. Um, Mark Lowe, uh, he is a Tennessean. He lives um, over near Nashville, and he has got a great Facebook video series that he does. Um, Michael John Neal genealogy website, Eastman's online genealogy. Um, they always have a listserv, things that they, um, hints that they give. Um, so I get their emails. There's lots of lectures everywhere. Just kind of Google what you want to know um, with genealogy and you're more than likely going to find it somewhere. Uh, the DAR library has lots of information. Uh, they've got lots of webinars that they've done and have been doing. And then you can take lots of classes. Um, IGHR, SLIG, um, usually is in January. It was online this year. GRIP usually is in Pittsburgh. It's online this year in June. Um, Roots Tech, for the first time, um, it actually goes through um, family search. It goes between Salt Lake City and London. It's a huge conference that they have. This year it is virtual. Um, it is this week, February 25th through 27th, free. But the thing is, you don't have to be online between the 25th and 27th. You register for it free, and then you it, everything's pre-recorded, and you have up to a year to watch everything. So free classes, you gotta love it. Um, Tiger or Tigger for Texas, um, National Genealogical Society. There's just lots of places. And then some of the names, some of the people um, in their field that teach different courses um, from whatever their specialty is, from law and DNA and church records. Um, lots of people's names. So, what questions do you have? Where do you recommend a, somebody just absolutely begin? Which one of those, like the, the DNA kits, would you say would be for beginners? Um, for somebody just starting, what I would do to get probably the most bang for your buck is Ancestry, uh, because a lot of people are on Ancestry. Okay. And they run specials all the time. So wait for, you know, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Um, they'll be running specials. I think they just did one for President's Day. So you can find them around $59. Okay. Like I said, when you do DNA, you always have to be prepared for anything. Like knowing that my grandfather is not my biological grandfather. We had no clue. Yeah. What other questions? Helpful, yes, no? Definitely interesting. How did I do, Virginia? Up, oh, you're on mute. Yeah. One of the best sets of records in Claiborne County is the land records, if you're researching Claiborne County, because they say they'll tell you they're burned, but you go over there and only a few burned. Mm. <laughs> but the marriage records don't start until 1836. Uh, Claiborne County is an interesting county to do research in. It really is. I thought your presentation was very good. I taught genealogy for years. And I think you covered it nicely. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And actually from one of my cousins that passed away in California, uh, my mom and I inherited a lot of her books 
And I actually have that, was it Old Town Taswell or that Taswell book that everybody's like, oh, you've got what? I'm like, yeah, I've got it. <laughs> um, what's the best thing to do? I have a question. What's the best thing to do? We're on there now. Old D. I mean, old, old D that you don't want to really keep, but. What do you do with them? Does the courthouse want them? Well, I don't know. I'm sure they're on record, but then this is the paper copy. I, or I, historical society? I doubt that they have any room for it in their county, but I don't. I don't want to burn them. I mean, I hate to throw them away, but I ran across a few that was, you know, been passed on that had a couple of relatives that mentioned, you know, some land in it, but nothing really that I really want to keep, but I didn't want to throw them away. Well, if it's in this area, maybe over at ETSU at the, their um, Appalachian archives. Okay. They might want it there in their manuscript collection. Or, you know, there's a lot of different places like UGA at the Hargrit Library I mean, they, they've got vaults and vaults and vaults all over campus. That it depends on what you want. You look well in advance, because if there's something that I want, it may be in cold storage 20 miles down the road. And so they've got to have a couple of days notice and I'll say, I'll be there Friday between this time and this time. And so then they'll know and have it there. So I'll maybe look at any of the archives. I got one from James K. Polk if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> I do, seriously. He's president of James K. Polk. A deed? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's we, pretty We can sell that. We'll sell it. A guy gave it. I'm not selling that. Auction it off. <laughs> hey, why wasn't that in the auction? <laughs> <laughs> Someone asked a question about where was the closest microfilm? Uh, place. Microfilm, there. yeah, microfilm we, reader around here. I I tell you something that I really that lady's talking about some surprises she had. We did some ancestry through ancestry, and uh, we found out that my fifth grandfather was one of the founders of Bristol, Virginia. He had a fort there. And he supplied settlers going through the West. And more or less, the city of Bristol was built around that fort. And uh, he was an Indian fighter. And he had 22,000 acres in Maryland. And some way he got mixed up with some bad trades with Indians and they took all his <laughs> land away. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. And, uh, Boy, that was strange. <laughs> Closest microfilm reader. LMU used to have some, have some, but I don't know if they're still there or not. Yeah, they used to, but I don't know. Microfilm oh. Now, Lake County, Lake County, Virginia has got some really old deed uh, books that go way back. Lee County, you know, was founded in 17, Johnson was founded in 1794. So there's some really uh, old records there in Lee County. Courthouse. Mm -hmm. microfilm, microfilm readers, you might want to check uh, the libraries. The Townsville Library did have them. They did or didn't? Did. They did. did. And uh, there's a place in the courthouse. Uh, that had one. Uh, it's I can't remember now what uh, Joyce Watson was in charge of it. They had one there a few years ago, in a little office there. And archives generally does like I know the Georgia Archives and Tennessee Archives has them because I've used them. This has been great. Oh, I think the LDS Family History Center down in Pals Valley might have microfilm readers. 
Mm. A family history center in the LDS church. Yeah. Oh, the LDS one is broken. <laughs> yeah, let's check at the LMU library because uh, they were there uh, 10 years ago, but I don't know since they remodeled that downstairs and I don't know what they did with all those. <laughs> Yeah, you would think that they would keep some or or the museum. Yes. The uh -huh. museum would have to have it in their archives. Talk with Natalie Sweet, she would know. Right. Yeah. It's Thank always you. always like this good mystery of how to, to link up my family. <laughs> we traced theirs all the way back to Wales. Probably most of the people from around here, I think, go back to Scotland, Wales, England, UK, yeah. that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found records in the churches where they went to church. Yeah, right. or, or mixed with Cherokee Indians, too, <laughs> in this area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this has been great, Dr. Pebworth. We, we surely appreciate it. I'm glad I asked you to do this. Oh, absolutely. You know, if you wanted a, a, an area to to focus on or just, you know, different tips or tricks that I use. Um, you know, I haven't, even though I've been doing it for a while, I haven't been doing it for a while. Um, you know, you can always learn new trip tips and tricks. Um, you know, I've taken Mark Lowe's class now two times and I'll take it again um, this summer. And he's great for all kinds of, of tips. I love watching his Facebook videos. Okay. Because you just never know. A lot of it is getting organized. And then trying not to fall down, as we say, the rabbit hole. Because <laughs> you start looking at a book. You know, we'll sit there at the DAR library. There's a group of us that sit together. And, you know, you're going through and all of a sudden you look up and you're like, somebody help me. I just went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Um, or, or what's neat is, you know, pulling out your big genealogy chart. And we had this lady um, for two years had been sitting next to us. And finally, being nosy, like we all are in genealogy, she leans over and Marcy leans over and goes, that's my ancestor, that's my ancestor, and that's my ancestor. Hi, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably all related. Probably all related. Guys, You've been here long enough, you probably are. Absolutely. So um, if we have follow-up questions, is it okay if they email you or they can email me to email you? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, great, guys. And I have recorded this, so we can, we can go back to it for review. I'll, we'll post it on our LMU YouTube, um, so you can go back to it if you missed anything or, or uh, wanted to see something again about it. That was a great PowerPoint. It was great for beginners, mm -hmm. and, and we appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I enjoyed it. It's very good. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Thank Bye. you.